get started. Um, I'm hoping that this will be a really interactive session. So if you have questions at any time, feel free to uh, raise your hand and, and we'll get the question answered. I will repeat questions so that we have them for the video. Uh, and if you want to use a mic, there's also a mic to ask questions as well. Um, so first of all, I want to ask, how many of you have contributed to open source before? All right, quite a number of you. Cool. Uh, so some of this content will be pretty basic because I want to cover all of the bases. But also, how many of you would say that you're like a new contributor to open source? All right. So how many people have been doing it for like a year or more? OK. Why are you guys here? <laughs> Maybe are you, are you interested in like how you can get the rest of your company involved maybe in open source? Okay, a lot, I think a lot of people are, are interested in that as well. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the philosophy of open source, tips and tricks for getting involved in open source projects, and give a lot of the information that a lot of newcomers to open source uh, don't necessarily pick up right away. Um, and as I said, I want this to be a really interactive session. Please raise your hand and we'll, we'll get questions answered. So first of all, I wanna talk about what open source actually is before we get into how do I contribute to it. Open source essentially is a licensing model. To be open source, you have to meet a particular set, uh, have one of many open source licenses. The open source initiative defines a list of licenses that are considered open source. Um, some of those licenses have slightly different terms. So in open source, we have this um, concept of a permissive license versus a copyleft license. A copyleft license wants you to give your contributions back. And the permissive license says you can do with what you what you want. If you want to give it back, that's great, but you don't have to. I'm not going to get into a lot of the details because each license is going to be slightly different. One of the things to note is that you shouldn't you should be very careful about mix mixing and matching open source projects with different licenses. Uh, because some open, not all open source licenses are compatible. So it's very important to uh, talk with your, your lawyers and your company and understand which open source licenses are compatible with each other and what your obligations under those licenses are. There are also uh, other things that are open source that are not just code. So for example, there's the open source hardware initiative where if a, a board manufacturer wants to allow someone to take their schematic and modify it and then redistribute that schematic, then you can license it under an open source hardware license. And so you can check out the open source hardware initiative for more information about those sorts of licenses. There's also uh, open source, um, other open source projects like documentation or works of art and those are licensed under the Creative Commons, which is also a considered an open source license. But open source is more than just a license. Open source is about an international community of developers that collaborate together. And so open source is about sharing code and about getting feedback and making the best possible product that you can. Uh, so a lot of people, when they first get involved in open source, they're concerned about working in the public because uh, everything that open source developers do is in the public. And so a lot of people's concerns are, well, what if people see the, my code and, how, and, and all the bugs in my code and the mistakes I make because I have to go and, and interact on uh, public, public forums, public mailing lists. Um, oftentimes people are concerned with open source because open source is also is often in 
safety critical systems. So newcomers are often worried about breaking things. They're, they're worried uh, as well about uh, open source maintainers uh, being grumpy at them for breaking things or for not getting their code perfect. Uh, and they're, they're concerned as well, especially if you work with proprietary code, a lot of people are concerned about mixing open source and proprietary code and contaminating work code. And so these are some of the concerns that people have when they're coming in to open source as a newcomer. Uh, but we'll address some of those concerns in this talk. A lot of the concerns, especially around legal concerns, you need to go talk with your own uh, lawyers within your company and talk with people who are versed in the art of uh, open source legal matters because I am not a lawyer. <laughs> so that is my disclaimer for this talk. So when people think of contributing to open source, the first thing they often think of is code. But you can contribute a whole host of other things to open source projects. And these are all things that will get you credibility and uh, get you praise within an open source community. So it's not just codes. You can submit bug reports. You can, if you find a bug and you write a test and you fix it, uh, and then you write a test to find that bug again, you are giving valuable contributions to a project. Um, even giving, even the act of being on a mailing list or being on an IRC channel and answering questions, you are still contributing to code. So there's a lot of people that say, I'm not a contributor to open source, but they're still sitting there answering questions, helping newcomers, and this is a very valuable thing to do. Uh, there's, there's also things like writing documentations, writing blog posts, doing tutorials. These are all ways to contribute to open source that are often not recognized in our community that likes to focus on technical aspects and technical code contributions. Any questions so far? We can talk afterwards. <laughs> uh, this is all that would fit on the slide. Uh, so for when people start to get involved in open source communities, it's like walking into your local coffee shop There's and, and you're new. There's a lot of established relationships that you may or may not know about when you walk into an open source community. There's people who have worked together for years and they know how each other codes. They, they can just say, oh yeah, and we'll do it this way, and they know immediately how. So when you walk into a new open source community, it's your job to kind of figure out what those relationships are. Uh, there might be a whole bunch of people from different backgrounds. They might be from different companies. They may not be paid to work on the code. They may be hobbyists or academics. And so figuring out how the community relationship structure is very important. Um, a lot of the times it's useful to note that there are subgroups within open source projects. So within the Linux kernel, you may have different subsystems with different people working on it. Some people might be working on USB, some people might be working on the networking layer, and so you need to figure out who is working on what. And sometimes there will be a file called maintainers, or you'll be able to look at the, the history from the repo and figure out who is the maintainers. But it's very important to identify who the key players are there so that when you do start to contribute or you do report a bug, you know who to listen to and maybe who doesn't know what they're talking about or is maybe a troll. Um, there are a whole bunch of different community norms uh, depending on which open source community you work with. Um, I'm going to talk, give you a general framework for how a lot of open source communities work and then you'll be able to find which tools the community is using. But until you sit there on an open source community mailing list and actually learn about how the community collaborates, you're not going to be effective in working with that community. So there's a lot of lurking that needs to go on before you actually get involved in an open source community. Uh, because a lot of the document, uh, a lot of the community norms are not going to be documented. Yes. <laughs> 
Um, so there's there's a couple different things you can do, um, and let's let's get into the next slide, and I'll like get into that. So there's a lot of different tools that open source communities are going to use to collaborate. Um, and this is the framework for what you should look for whenever you enter a new open source community. Your first question when you enter an open source community shouldn't be, where's the source code? Your first question should be, how do I collaborate with this community? How do I talk to the people I need to talk to to get my work done? So every open source community is going to have a place where they'll, they'll host their source code. Uh, that may be GitHub, that might be self-hosted, they may even still be on SourceForge. Um, there will be some sort of website where you can, you can actually download the source code. And then there will be some sort of way for people to, to answer short, quick questions. And these are the sorts of questions like, I am starting to go through the installation process, I run into this bug, I have this error, can someone help me? Like these are the sort of quick back and forth questions that you wanna be able to get answered. And so all open source projects will have a, f a way, a tool to do that. It might be IRC, which is Internet Relay Chat, it might be Jabber, it might be a forum, discourse, matters most, but it's gonna be some sort of tool where you get this quick back and forth, quick back and forth. Um, and then you'll also have tools where there's gonna be these long form design discussions. That might be a mailing list, you might be submitting your contributions to Garrett, uh, or you may have another way to contribute. But I think when you're doing the lurking, it's very important to identify those two key areas, because some people miss the two. Some people will find the mailing list and they'll see patches going back and forth, but because they don't look for that, sh that form, uh, form where they can answer quick questions, they miss half the conversation. So it's important to lurk on both. So if a project has both a mailing list and an IRC channel, be on both so that you can see what the community norms are. When someone contributes like a, a small patch, see who gives feedback. And then you'll be able to learn from them and figure out how to get, uh, how to do contributions better. Does that answer your question? Okay. Um, the other things, other types of tools that open source project uses, um, a lot of open source projects will use continuous integration to be able to test their code. So this might be, uh, Jenkins, it might be another uh, continuous integration system, but a lot of them will have a set of tests that they want you to run before you actually make your contribution. Um, there will be a bug tracking tool. This might be Bugzilla or Launchpad or um, Jira, a whole track, a whole bunch of other different open source tools. Um, and documentation. And it's important to note that documentation is often split into the official documentation and then the unofficial documentation. So the documentation might be a quick start guide, it may be a document that describes the features that are involved, but then you'll also have a, a, a documentation that's maintained by the developers that is usually a little bit of a, out of date might not be organized very well, but might have uh, the answer to your problems. And those are gonna be like a, a wiki or um, maybe a stack overflow forum. Uh, these sorts of things are, so there's this official documentation and unofficial documentation. All right, any questions so far? All right. Ah, so let's talk about some of the different roles that are in an open source community. In an open source community, one of the key members you need to look out for is a maintainer. Sometimes they're also called a core contributor, uh, a code reviewer, there's a lot of different things, but they are someone in a position of authority within the project. And it's very useful to you to know who is in a position of authority in the project. 
Uh, a maintainer is kind of like a park ranger. They answer random questions from a lot of people. They clean up people's trash and, and fix bugs. And they also go and make sure that their particular area is um, going to be maintainable for a long time. So they're very interested in the long-term health of the project. So when interacting with the maintainer and the maintainer says, I don't like this code, I want you to re-architect it this way, it's not that they have a personal problem with your code or that you're a bad coder, but they know that your code is going to outlast your contributions to that project, especially when you're new. And they know that they're gonna have to maintain that code, maybe for years, maybe not for money. And so they want to make sure that the best code possible gets in. Um, and their reputation is on the line for each patch. If you say, hey, I'm gonna submit this new feature, and they say, oh, well, uh, actually, you didn't address all these concerns. I want to make sure that the feature also includes you know, this particular functionality. And you push and you say, uh, oh, but I'll get that done later. Let's just merge it now and start testing it. That's, that's not gonna fly, because the maintainer has no guarantee that you are gonna actually stick around. Um, projects also have multiple maintainers. Sometimes there are sub-projects and sub-maintainers. And so, as I said, you need to know uh, the structure of the project. So let's talk a little bit about your first contribution and getting involved in the project and getting on board. Um, one of the, the key problems that I've seen from a lot of people that I mentioned in the keynote this morning is that people go and they write a whole bunch of code off in a corner, they don't ask questions, they don't communicate with the project, and then they go and submit this giant chunk of code to the project. So it's, it's very hard because when you do that, the maintainer has no uh, trust in you. You're a new member to the project, uh, you've just dropped this giant chunk of code that they're going to have to maintain. And so it's important that before you start to submit your larger chunk of, of contributions, that you kind of work your way up. You know, do a couple of bug reports, uh, make uh, some small changes, and start very small. Start interacting with the community. Start asking questions. Start being on IRC. Start doing code review. It's very important to get integrated into the community before you start giving those large chunks of code back. Um, often when you jump into a new project that's in a new area, there's gonna be a whole bunch of vocab, a whole bunch of acronyms. I myself, I like to keep a list of all of the terms that I didn't understand when I first started on an open source project. I will document where I found the answer to what that was is. Uh, and then I will often try to give that back to the project. Because if you're improving their documentation for the next newcomer, you're proving that you also have learned things. And so it's very useful for establishing that trust relationship with the maintainer to do some documentation fixes. Um, and uh, so I've been talking about like how do you build trust relationship with maintainers. You can also do code review. Uh, and sometimes reviewing other people's code is really useful because you can start to learn design patterns or what the community expects. Uh, even if you're not giving you know, big feedback, you can ask questions about other people's code that they've submitted. You know, you can say, why did you do it this way? Why are you using this API instead of the API that the documentation recommends? And maybe it turns out that the documentation is old, and then that's something you can do to fix. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways that you can get involved. Um, but those, those you know, lurking on the mailing list, lurking in those, those different communication channels is very useful for learning community norms. All right, any questions? All right, speaking of questions, tips for answering, asking questions. Uh, because when you're a newcomer, oftentimes 
you come into an open source project and you're like, I don't even know how to start. I don't, I don't understand what they're talking about and I don't even know where to start asking questions. Uh, and if you go and you send a giant document to a maintainer and say, I'm trying to answer all of these questions or I'm trying to work on a project and I don't understand how USB works. If you ask these broad, generic questions, the maintainer is not going to have time to respond. But you can kind of work around it with a social hack. Um, so if you start to ask very precise questions, and if you document like where you looked for the answers to those questions, then the maintainer knows that you have done your homework, right? Um, and might actually be more inclined to answer your questions. But if you uh, don't document where you looked, uh, then they might point you, they might just say, oh, point you to the documentation. And then you have to say, well, the documentation doesn't actually cover my question. All right, so tips for bug reporting. Um, I've been a maintainer in the Linux kernel. Uh, I was a maintainer for about seven years. And as a maintainer, there were a couple of pet peeves when people would report bugs that were really, really annoying to me. Um, one of the things is that as a maintainer, you get a massive, massive amount of email. And so if you as a bug reporter don't figure out who to send your bug to, and you just send it to the mailing list, it's most likely going to get lost. Uh, so you need to do your research and figure out who is the most likely person to actually fix this bug or answer my question. And the same goes for, for asking questions. Always find the person who is most likely to answer your question and add them to the CC list or uh, at them on whatever forum software you're using. Um, the other thing is, when you report a bug, uh, don't just say it's broken. Please walk me through how it's broken. What did you expect? What error messages did you get? Uh, was there anything odd about your system installation? Please give me hardware information, platform information, OS versions. Um, a lot of open source projects will have a list of things you can provide when you're, when you're getting a bug. Some of them will have a script that will gather all that information for you, uh, and you should be able to provide that as uh, something to the maintainer for how to reproduce the bug. Um, also, don't report a bug and then go away. It is so frustrating as an open source maintainer for someone to report that they have a problem and you start looking at the logs and, and you need more information from them and then you post information like, hey, I need you to enable this debugging and then they never come back and you never know and sometimes you have a fix and you say, oh, I think this will fix the problem but if the bug reporter doesn't actually come back and say, yes, this fixed my problem, uh, then I'm not going to merge that code because it's code that hasn't been tested. Uh, so don't report and then walk away. If you have hardware that you need to reproduce uh, the particular problem, please hold on to it. I hate it when people say, oh yeah, that, you know, that broken USB device, I threw it away. It's like, please, just, just hold on to it and keep like the particular cables you use. Um, so tips for code review. Um, when I go and I submit code to a project, oftentimes it will be in several different commits, several different patches. Uh, and I will get a long list of feedback based uh, you know, on each commit or each patch. Uh, and in that point, what I do is I just make a little text file and I just have notes on all of the different things that people have asked me to change. And then when I go and resubmit my second version, in my cover letter or get pull request, I will say this version fixes list of things that should be fixed. And then the maintainers that have had this mental list of you have to fix this, you have to fix this, we talked back and forth about this, that's not really a problem, they can look at that list and just go, okay, 
that looks great. And if you have patches or commits that haven't changed between the two versions, just say patches 9 through 12 are the same. So that the maintainer ha doesn't have to go back and review those patches that haven't changed. Um, if you disagree with a feedback from a maintainer, back yourself up with facts. Because if a maintainer says, this isn't up to our coding style, and you say your coding style is stupid, that's not going to fly. Now, if you're having a discussion and the maintainer says, I think it would be more efficient if we did it this way, and you disagree, say, I, th I think if we did it this way, it would be more efficient, I'm thinking of these usage cases and this particular data, and then maybe the maintainer says, oh, well, that's not a, uh, a usage case that very many people run into, M more people use it this way. You can have that back and forth conversation about the feedback, but only if you provide facts. Um, the other important thing to note about code review is that, and, and this is something that a lot of open source newcomers don't understand. When you submit code to a project, you're trying to solve a problem. You are not trying to get your particular code into a project. You're trying to solve a problem. So if someone has already been working on this and they beat you to submitting the patch, that's fine because the problem was solved. If an architect says, uh, I need to, you to rewrite this to be more maintainable, that's fine because eventually the problem gets solved. It's not about getting your particular code in. So it's, it's important to not be too attached to your particular version of the code. All right, any, any questions on code review? All right. Um, so there's a lot of different um, signs for, for finding welcoming open source communities. A lot of people get involved in open source because their company needs them to work on a particular open source project because it's part of their business strategy. However, if you want to just get involved in open source in general, um, then th it's important to find a welcoming project. Uh, usually open, uh, welcoming open source projects will have good documentation. They might have a code of conduct uh, so that there's not grumpy maintainers that you run into. Um, and then they will also advertise their communication channels. If you find a project where you can't find uh, their mailing list or their IRC channels, they may not actually want contributions back. Um, there's a lot of open source communities where they just want to hack on things and they want to do their own thing. Uh, but there are also other open source communities that are really all about mentoring uh, and they're really welcoming to newcomers. So there's a lot of different specific open source projects that I have in mind that are pretty friendly for open source newcomers. Um, but usually you can find those if you look at the list of projects that participate uh, either in the uh, Ricci internship program or the Google Summer of Code internship program because those are already programs where there's mentors who are, are dedicated to getting newcomers involved in open source. And so it's better to look at those lists and try to figure out what's a good project to start getting involved in open source. All right. So at this point, uh, I'm out of slides. There's a couple different things we could do. One is, um, let me see a show of hands. How many are newcomers to open source contributing? Okay, cool. Uh, so one thing we could do is go through a particular project and find those communication channels that I talked about. Uh, and the other thing I could do is I can just answer any pressing general questions that people have. So if people have questions, then, uh, Please go for it. And, and anything about open source communities or getting involved or philosophy of open source, which I talked a little bit about this morning, are, are certainly on topic. <laughs> 
Where would you go to get a good example of a code of conduct if you wanted to establish one for a community? Uh, so the, the question was about code of conducts and how to, to find one for an established community. Um, there is a page on the Geek Feminism Wiki that uh, gives criteria for a good code of conduct and what to look for. Uh, but one particular thing to note for code of conduct is that it's important you don't just have the code itself. You have to have people to enforce it, people who are gonna answer questions, and people who are trained to enforce your code of conduct. Because if you just have your core open source developers who are involved in code of conduct enforcement, first of all, no one knows who is actually in charge of dealing with code of conduct uh, reports, and they also don't know how to handle them, and people may have differing views on what is and is not a code of conduct. Uh, so when someone asks me a question about what code of conduct should I use, I usually tell them, you should just come to me, we'll have a conversation. I, this is part of why I do diversity consulting, because I wanna make sure that open source communities are more inclusive and I'm happy to help you uh, do training and find a good code of conduct. Uh, yes. So if you have coworkers that you're trying to get encouraged to participate as part of their job, say they're working on a, a new uh, network driver, for example, how can you facilitate them getting on the mailing lists and, you know, you could say get on the mailing list and they can say okay and then they just lurk there and never do anything. How do you, how do you close the gap? Right, so the, the question was about how do you get someone from being a lurker to actually contributing code, especially if it's a coworker. I mean it may be as simple as, hey, let's sit down together and do like a small patch together and then, we, and then you and I can walk through how to submit it upstream. Because I think once you get like that first patch in, it's kind of like a little adrenaline shot, and you're like, ooh, I can do this. Um, especially if you are already an established person in that community. Because you being CC'd on that and supporting the person is going to lend so much more credence to their small contribution than if they just did it on their own. All right, any more questions? If not, I'll go through a project for the, the few newcomers that are in the room on how to find those contribution channels. Oh, there's a question in the back. Actually, it's uh, just to follow up to the last question that was asked. So one thing that I found helpful for uh, myself and getting other coworkers of mine in previous jobs comfortable contributing to open source is to have some internal forum so that person doesn't feel like they have to go directly out to what they might feel is a scary community. Um, one job I had, we had an internal mailing list that people that were experts uh, in that subsystem or whatever could review things ahead of time, um, give that person internal feedback that felt a lot more comfortable before they exposed them to the rest of the community. Yeah, it was, it was the same thing. We had several internal uh, mailing lists when I worked at Intel uh, that were for people who were new to contributing to the Linux kernel. Uh, and oftentimes that meant that they went through a whole bunch of code review before that went out. But the thing is that you have to remember is that the open source community doesn't see that back and forth and doesn't see that code review. So then you go, some newcomer comes and submits a bunch of patches that have versioning information or they have signed off by, by people and the open source community doesn't see that. So you have to be careful to also include the context that you got from review on that mailing list when you submit to the public. Like you have to go and review your code with a newcomer's eyes to figure out is this going to make sense to the community because we've reviewed it internally. <laughs> 
So I'm just going to go back to that list of community collaboration tools. So for the, the newcomers in the room, we're looking for source code. We're looking for a way to ha answer a quick question, where to have a design discussion about contributions, and then maybe continuous integration, bug tracking, and documentation. So the example I'm going to use here is the Yocto project. Uh, and the Yocto project, oh, hold on. Uh, and the Yocto project, so we're going to first go and look and figure out where they host their, their source code. So when I think of source code, I'm really looking for like a link to their repository. But to me, downloads looks like somewhere maybe I could find the source code. Uh, so if you go to downloads, you'll see that you can actually find tarballs of the um, tarballs, or you can find the Git repository. Um, so the next thing that we would be looking for would be a way to have short questions answered. So let's try to find that on the Yocto um, page. Mm. my mouse is not working. In any case, I don't think we can go through all the examples, but if you go to something like the Yocto project with that list I gave you, you'll be able to find things like their bug tracker, the IRC, the mailing list, and so it's useful to have that particular list in mind when you're going to projects. All right, any additional questions? You can just, I, I'll repeat it if you don't want to wait for the mic. I'm interested in any kind of quick tips that you can do, to, because there's a phenomenon with GitHub projects where you put it on GitHub and you're done. Are there any quick tips <laughs> you can make a GitHub personal project more, more you know, appealing? Right, so, so with GitHub, yeah, I think a lot of people think, oh, if we have a project and we push it on GitHub, then everyone's gonna come and it's gonna be great. Um, tips for making GitHub projects work. You have to also reach people outside of GitHub. So it can't just be all interacting on GitHub. You need to write blog posts about the particular project. You need to be on Stack Overflow, asking, answering questions. You need to have someone, a bunch of people essentially, promoting your project. Uh, as for like what you can put on GitHub to make it more appealing, make sure you have a top level readme that outlines you know, how, where all your communication channels are, how to get started contributing. Uh, make sure that in your um, bug tracker, which the GitHub issue tracker is not that great, but uh, make sure to tag a bunch of newcomer friendly bugs. So small things that someone can do in like less than a day and get it submitted. Uh, a lot of people, especially maintainers that are overloaded, they like to hold on to those things because those are the things that they can do and still keep in touch with the code base, but even though it's gonna take more work to get those up there, uh, it's going to actually engage your community more. Um, good documentation, uh, and yeah, make sure you're resp responsive to people. Uh, I know um, there's a GitHub project that one of my co, my, one of the people I know maintains, and like he's not able to get email notifications when people send him pull requests, it's very strange. So sometimes make sure that GitHub is not like losing your notifications. <laughs> Thank you. Ah, see that's, that's a question I get asked a lot, that there's no definitive list of all of the open source projects. Um, there are companies like Black Duck that, that go and um, 
scan projects for licensing, but you, what you could do, for example, is you could go on GitHub and you could search for a particular license term. And then you could find open source projects that have that license. But there's no good list of here's all of the open source projects. And that's why I suggest if you're starting to get involved with open source, go look at the list on Google Summer of Code and Outreachy to find a good project that's, that, that will be welcoming to newcomers. <laughs> yeah, there's, it's, we're all very disorganized. There's no like key organization because even there are several organizations that host projects. There's like the Linux Foundation and uh, the Apache Foundation um, and uh, the Software Freedom Conservancy. They host a bunch of open source projects, but no one's ever made a list of all the open source projects. Additional questions? All right. Thank you very much, everyone. If you want to talk with me afterwards, I am, am free after this. Thanks. <laughs>